<laughs> okay, so so let me introduce our uh, our next speaker, Abed Marka from uh, the University of Göttingen. Is uh, you're a postdoc, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, postdoc with uh, Professor Mikhail Vibral, who's one of the organisers of the uh, of the workshop. Uh, this is a talk on uh, a differentiable measure uh, of partial information decomposition, which uh, I'm very much looking forward to. So over to you, Abed. Okay, thanks. So today I'm going to explain about this uh, differentiable measure of partial information decomposition, which is based solely on information theoretic principles. This work is joint work between me and Aaron Gutnicht and then uh, Michael Vibral. Um, so I will start first by explaining what is partial information decomposition. And then I will go on to talk about um, applying PID. Can we apply PID or partial information decomposition to neuroscience problems? And if so, what are the desirable properties for PID measures that we should have? And then I'm going to explain the idea of mutual information being derived from probability exclusions, which will align a little bit with what Thomas has have explained uh, before. And then I'm going to define our measure um, of partial information decomposition based on something called shared exclusions. Um, so let's start with partial information decomposition. So let's say that we have one source carrying information about the target. You can think about this one neuron firing towards another neuron. You can think that you have a neural response and one stimuli. And basically, if you want to uh, compute the information contribution of, 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 of source one or of the neural activity about the stimuli, you basically compute the, the, the mutual information between uh, the source and the target. Um, and let's say now that, that we get it a little bit uh, more complicated and we say that we have now two, two sources and one target. Similarly, you can think that you have one stimulus and two uh, neural responses. And basically, you want to know the total information contribution of these neural responses about the target, about the stimulus. And basically, you can measure that also by the uh, mutual information, the joint mutual information of S1 and S2 about T. But also, we can ask something much more deep. So we can ask about finer contributions here. So basically, we can ask what information that can be uh, contributed uniquely by S1 about T. So this information we can only get by looking at S1, not by looking at S2, not by looking at anything else. So this information is bounded to S1. And it's, it's, it's information about T from S1. And similarly, we can say that about S2. Um, but I want to, to assert this for people who know about conditional mutual information. The, the, the unique information is different from conditional mutual information. So conditional mutual information tells us what's the information that S1 has about T when we already have observed S2, when we have S2. So obviously, unique information is part of this information. But also in this case, S1 can use S2 or can get, uh, collaborate with S2 and have more information something which we call the some synergistic effect. And this is a, a different type of information which we can have. So this information is the information that we can get about the target if we observe both sources. If we have both sources, then we can get this information. It's like, it's like a collaboration or synergistic information about the target. And finally, we can talk about the shared information. So this information we can get if we look at S1, if we look at S2, we, we can infer this information. We have this information about the target. So it's like redundant in some sense, or we can think about it shared between the two sources um, about the target. Um, so this is what we have right now. So the total information that these two sources have about the target, we can decompose it into unique information from each source and synergistic information and shared information. So let me give a little bit of example to, to just like illustrate more the idea. So let's take the AND example. So we have two bits. The sources are two binary bits. They are equally liar, equally uh, uniformly distributed, and the target is just what what comes out of the AND gate. Um, and, and and if we look at, at the source uh, S1, if it takes the value zero, if we are observing zero, then we will always observe that the target is, is getting zero. So, so somehow, like, like having a, a zero realization for S1 give us some information already about the target. Whereas if we have S1 take the value one, then it's equally likely that the target will be zero or one. So we cannot infer any information there about the target, whether it's correct, we cannot predict the target. Similarly for S2. 
And so basically, this, uh, this switching, when we have one, when, when any of the sources take the value one, that we don't have any, we have uncertainty what the target is, suggests that there should be synergistic contribution by S1 and S2. There should be this synergy in order to get like the whole information. So this we can agree on. It's, it's, it's like a very intuitive. And the next point is, is whether, whether, whether the zero case it should we consider this just all of it as shared information or should we say that it's it's a little bit of shared information and some sort of unique information it's not straightforward to decide that so basically we need some sort of a measure we need some sort of a measure in order to measure these quantities and basically just to to wrap up everything um before going to to the idea of measures so partial information decomposition is is all about partitioning mutual information into uh, finer parts. So we have seen that it partitions the, the total mutual information, the joint mutual information of S1 and S2, uh, and S2 about T into different parts, synergy, shared, and unique. Um, so this is this is the, the total mutual information, and, and we can see the unique part of S1, the unique part of S2, and the shared part between S1 and S2, and what's left is the synergy. This is also why, why we are referring to it by CI, because we can think also about it as the complementary information. And why we are putting it at the end, is the reason is if we think about what's the information that S1 has about T. This information is the unique information that it has about T, and also the shared information with S2. So, so this is also, also this decomposition decomposes any uh, mutual information quantity. And also similarly for S2. And also, as, as we have, as, as I have said before, it also decomposes the conditional mutual information into synergistic part and the unique part of, 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 the, of the source itself. Um, so, um, so the idea now is how to evaluate uh, these PID terms. So from this figure, or from this from this consistency equations, we can get some sort of of, of a three independent equations uh, where we have these uh, these these uh, these, uh, these PID terms um, are there as, as unknowns, and we know, we want to know them. So basically, we need to define at least one of the values in order to get one of the terms in order to get the, the, the whole uh, the whole thing, the, the other terms. So basically, it, it seems that a shared information is, is, is a good candidate to define. It appears in everything. It's the smallest thing, um, or, or basically, it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a more a more relaxed thing that we can have. Um, but but this turned out to be a difficult task. And, and then the, the similar work um, of, of Williams and Beer, uh, which would, in which they introduced a PID framework. And the idea was, OK, we know how it looks like for two sources. And what they did is that they generalized this for, for, for any number of sources. We can know the number of, of information contributions. And also, they, they figured out the relations between these different information contributions and how they, they decompose the mutual information and all of, all of these, um, these things. And there is there is a, a long list of literature of, of different measures. So Williams and Beer defined a measure, and there are other measures which have been defined. So that we, we today we are going to define a new measure, which we think is is very useful at least for neuroscience, and, and it's very um, uh, intuitive to look at. Um, so just just to, to give you a little bit of an idea, I just wanna wanna play around uh, to go from two sources to three sources. So let's say now when we have only two sources, these are the quantities that we have. So if we have uh, S1 and S2 in, in one in one set, this means that we have a synergy. If we have them separated by curly braces, then, then this means that that we have a shared between uh, between the two things in the uh, between the two uh, sets or the two collection of sources. So th this would be the the synergy. This would be the unique information of S1. This would be shared information between S1 and S2, and this would be the unique information of S2. And so let's now add a new source. If we add a source X, so whenever we add the source on the diagram, we directly see that we have different um, information contributions that appears from X. So we have the unique, and we have X sharing with all the other contributions that it has, uh, it has existed before. And also, when we consider X, we can also think about the mutual information of X and S1, uh, the, uh, the joint mutual information of X and S1 about T. And once we add that, we directly get the synergy of S1 and X. So this is the information that we can only get by looking at S1 and X. And we can get something which we can get from either looking at S1 and S2 uh, collectively or looking at S1 and X collectively. And we can do the same thing for S2. 
and we get more and more quantities. And here I just want to highlight this quantity so we can get also the, the, the special quantity here is just a quantity where we have like uh, the, the information which we can infer by looking at any of the pairs. So if you look at S1 and S2 together, we can get this information or S1 and X or S2 and X. And obviously, finally, we can think about the joint mutual information of S1 and S2 and X about T. And then we get the, the final term, which is the pure synergy, which is the last term, the synergy between S1 and S2 and X. So the information we can get only by looking at these three sources. Um, so, so now let's move a little bit to, to, to neuroscience. Let's see. So we said that we need to define a PID measure in order to, 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 uh, to, to quantify these quantities. So we're asking ourselves, what are the desirable properties in order to make this measure applicable to, to neuroscience? Um, so I, I will start with this example. Why, why would we even use PID for neuroscience? I will motivate by this example. Why should we use, why should we analyze cortical processing by PID or using PID? So you know about the canonical cortical uh, uh, microcircuit. It exists in different uh, regions of the six uh, layer the mammalian neurocortex. And the, 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 the main thing about it that it serves various sensory, cognitive, and motor functions. So like really vast, diverse functions. And then the, the question which arises, how can a specific uh, circuit implement such a variety of different tasks? And this suggests that we need some, in order to, to understand that, we need some domain which doesn't care about the semantics, which is domain independent in order to formulate some sort of neural goals and see how, how these neural goals can, can, can implement different uh, motor and cognitive and sensory uh, functions. Um, and, and as Daniel Pulani yesterday uh, talked about information theory, and information theory is, is model agnostic, so it doesn't care about the semantics, it just presents itself as a really good uh, framework, and I'm just referring to Kay and Phillips, which have done some work on that uh, particular thing using information theory, but also now we have defined PID, which looks at, at, at really finer contributions, so it, it can provide a richer framework uh, to work with more than just uh, the classical information theory, just the mutual information. So, and this has been uh, investigated by Vibra and others, um, and then they, they show that it allows to describe neural goal functions more precisely than classical information theory. And ideally what we want is we could learn a PID-based neural function in simulated neural circuits in order to understand them better. So this would be our goal. And to, to get the, the idea much more intuitive to you or to get a little bit more, uh, more on the ground and not very much abstract. So let's say I'm putting this example, which, which Kay and Phillips had, uh, had in, in their work. So we have, we, have two, two, uh, we have a neuron which is receiving two types of inputs. So you can think about S1 being uh, like the receptive uh, input feed, it's a feed forward input, and then S2 is just a contextual input. And as Thomas said, it's just like the feedback which is coming from higher layers down and basically uh, you have this is the uh, the activation function and this is the output t the feed forward output to, to, the, to the higher layers again and 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 the sources here are, are are weighted so we have like a vector of, of inputs coming and a vector of inputs coming as, as receptive and contextual um, and then basically let's say that the, our goal function is is, is to, uh, to to maximize the the shared information between the two sources we want the, the contextual information to agree uh, as much as possible with the with the with the with the um, uh, with the with the receptive information that we are getting um, and then in order to do that uh, we need to do an iterative learning Via, via gradient descent. So we don't have any backprog here. We just have, have a simple gradient descent here. Um, and, and in order to do that, we need to update, and we have to update at each realization. So we need our PID measure to be local, to be pointwise. And also in order to update the input weights and use gradient descent, we need it, the PID measure should be like continuous and differentiable. It cannot be like a non-differentiable or it cannot have like vanishing gradients like horribly or something like that. So we need it to be differentiable and continuous. And th this is just one example. There are like plenty of examples. If you try to apply PID, you would see that you need these two properties, pointwise, especially in neuroscience, pointwise and differentiability. 
And so I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, ICAP as X. So it's it's I redundancy or I shared information based on shared exclusions. As X stands for shared exclusions measure, which is pointwise and continuously differentiable. And in order to define this, I'm I'm gonna try to explain the idea of mutual information being derived from probability exclusions. Um, so let's start by mutual information and let's go into, into the pointwise level, into the realizations level. So mutual information is just expected value of a pointwise mutual information. This is Fano's perspective on mutual information. And, 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 and as, we, uh, as we see here that, that the mutual information is the average of the information gain by observing T minus the information gain by observing T when S has already been observed. And I'm gonna explain in the next slide a little bit more about this because there's some interesting property about, about this, this, uh, this point was mutual information that it can be uh, negative. And, 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 and basically in order first to understand what is a uh, point was mutual information. So said that mutual information is the information that S1 ha uh, that S has about the target T. And if we talk about the point was mutual information is, is, is we are answering the question how much information the event that S has happened is informative about the event T happened. And, and, and here, to, to be less abstract, let's say that, that, that T is just uh, whether the weather is gonna be sunny or rainy, and S is just whether, whether the atmospheric pressure is, is low or high. And obviously negative uh, uh, PMI or point transmission information occurs when the second term here is, is, is larger than, than the first term. So, so what does that mean? So, so it means that the information gain or the surprise from observing T when S has already been observed is greater than that from when observing T in general. So let's say that, 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 that the atmospheric pressure is, is, is very low. And basically what we expect is that the weather would be rainy. But for, for us, we saw that the weather was, what happened is that the weather was super, super sunny. And that was very surprising for us. So the probability, the T condition, like, like having the weather being sunny when we have a very low uh, atmospheric pressure is highly unlikely. And this pulls the, this, this term to be very, very large. So we have a really information gain here or surprise at that. And so, 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 so S uh, somehow misled us because we were like expecting the weather to be rainy, but the weather was like, like shining and, 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 and not rainy at all. And, 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 and th this means that S has played like a misinformative or the low atmospheric pressure, this, this event has played a misinformative role for us about T. And this is how we can interpret when we have a negativity. So when, when, when observing, uh, after observing T, uh, after observing S, when T is, becomes less likely than, than, than T in general, this means that but basically S has misled us because S told us that T will not happen, but then T has happened. And that, that just got us very, very much surprised. So S played a misinformative role in this case. Um, so this also suggests that the PID point once PID measure inevitably would be negative. We will see later about that. So now let's try to, to explain this idea again, just by talking about excluding probability masses. So let's see, this is, this, is, this is what we have. This is the mutual information that we had. And basically we wanna, we, we, let's say this is T. This is the weather is, is gonna be shining, uh, like um, uh, clear. And this is the, the weather is gonna be rainy and storm, right? And then, and then this is the probability that the weather is gonna be shining. It's equally likely in this case. This is uh, Göttingen. It's, you never know when it's raining, you never know when it's uh, sunny. So, and then, and then you have S, it's, 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 it's an event that we had a low atmospheric pressure. So we have a low atmospheric pressure, and then basically what, what we can exclude is that we have a high atmospheric pressure. This is what we can exclude here. So what happened is, is that we have a low atmospheric pressure. So now we wanna see how, how are the chances that we are going to get a sunny uh, weather when we have a low atmospheric pressure. So we need to, to kind of uh, uh, work um, uh, with T in, in, the, in, the, in the basis that S has already happened. So in order to do that, basically, we can see obviously that, 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 that S partitions T into, into the, the things which, which agrees with S and the thing which is impossible because S has already happened. So that, 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 that part is already impossible. So what we are gonna do is we are gonna remove everything which is impossible from the perspective of S 
And then, okay, we remove that, we disturb the probability space. Now we have to rescale by what we have removed in order to, to regain back the probability space to sum up to one. And then we now see how, how T or the chances of T when S has already happened. And now for this one, we just compare it to the chances of T in general. And if the chances of T is, is, is now less likely, this means that, that, that if T has already, if, if T happened after, after S has happened, this means that S was misinforming because S told us that, that when, 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 when we have a low atmospheric pressure, then the weather is highly likely that it's, it's not going to be like uh, sunny. But for our surprise, we woke up and the weather was super, super sunny. And that was like misled us. So we canceled some, uh, some of our uh, plans that we were, wanted to do. Um, so basically, in order, to, in order to infer the information of S about T, what we are going to do is we are going to look at S when, uh, look, sorry, at T, or at the chances of T when S has already happened. And then we are going to compare that to the probability of T when S hasn't happened, or just in general. And this comparison will tell us how much information S has about T. And in this case, when we are, we are, when we are not averaging, it will tell us how much S is informative about T or how much S is misinformative about T. So these are the three steps that we are going to do. Remove, rescale in order to go to go to the to the to the remove everything which is incompatible with s rescale back to go back to the uh, to, to 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 a normal probability space where we can compare uh, compare the probability of t when s has already happened to the probability of t in general and then and then we will decide what to do after that so this is not only the idea for just one variable we can we can easily um, uh, generalize this idea for for more than one variable so if you talk about S1 and S2, so S, S1 is just the, the atmospheric pressure, and let's say the S2 is the temperature here. And, 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 and we want to see what information S1 and S2 has about the temperature. So, so let's say that that, that uh, has about, sorry, the, the T, whether this, uh, the weather is going to be sunny or, or rainy. So let's say that, um, uh, that this is uh, this is uh, this is T when the weather is sunny. This is when the weather is rainy. This is S one that tells us that we have a, a, a low uh, a, a low um, atmospheric pressure, and this is tells us that we have a high temperature. So we have a low atmospheric pressure, but we have a high temperature. Uh, and basically, uh, so now what, what we see, what we have seen is that we have seen both of them. So what happened is that we have a low temperature. Uh, sorry, we have a low atmospheric pressure, and we have a high temperature. So basically, we have to exclude everything which does not align with the low um, atmospheric pressure. And also, we have to exclude everything which does not align with the, with, the high, um, uh, with the high temperature. So basically, in order to see how T looks like uh, when we already observe the low atmospheric pressure and the high temperature, we have to remove everything which is incompatible with any of them. Basically, either it's compatible with having a low atmospheric pressure or it's compatible with having a high temperature. So we have to remove both of these. So, so basically we remove them and then we rescale in order to regain like a normal probability space so we can have a fair comparison with the probability of T and then we compare. And if the probability is less, then this means that a low temperature and then the, uh, a low atmospheric pressure and the high temperature misinformed us and told us that we will have a lay, uh, rainy weather whereas we got uh, and sunny weather, um, and so basically this is uh, this is this is the idea that we are we are go we are going after in, in this talk, um, and so so basically why we want to continue in this idea because mutual information in itself is a differentiable almost uh, everywhere this and it's pointwise. So basically what we are gonna try to do now is we are gonna try to define shared information, which is pointwise. And, 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 and differentiable. And we are going to use the RRC scheme in order to define it. Um, so let, let's try to do that. So, so we are going to define it based on, on shared exclusions. So, so first of all, I'm going to reiterate and explain again what is a pointwise shared information. So a pointwise shared information that, that, uh, of, 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 uh, of an event S1 and event S2 about an event T is accessible. Either, either, if either we observe that S1 has occurred or S2 has occurred. So if any of them has occurred, then this information should be accessible to us. Or then we can say that, that the shared information emerges. Um, 
And so uh, this is equivalent to just saying that the statement that S1 has occurred or S2 has occurred being true. So when the statement S1 has occurred or S2 has occurred is true, this means that we can have an emergence of shared information or shared information becomes uh, viable or accessible. And so if, if, if you want to compare the effect of shared, if, if you want to if you want to see how quantify shared information, then basically what we are going to do is we are going to compare what's the effect on T that this statement has compared to, to T in general, as we did in, in mutual information. So the mutual information that S1 has about T is 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 the information is it becomes accessible if we if, if s1 occurred right and then we compared that when s1 occurred we compared that its effect on t compared to when it doesn't happen so the same thing we are going to do here because shared information is tightly related to the statement that s1 has occurred or s2 has occurred so we're gonna this is going to see the effect of this statement on t and then compare it to p of t and then basically say okay this is how we quantify shared information so let's see how we are going to do it with, 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 with exclusions, basically. So, so this, is, this is what we had from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the mutual information. And now we said that shared information is accessible. If either S1 uh, or uh, starts making sense, if either we observed S1 or we observed S2. So if either any of them has occurred. Um, so this is equivalent to saying that none of the, uh, that, uh, to saying that, and neither anything which is inc incompatible with all of them didn't happen. So if either of them has happened, if either we, we saw a low, pr uh, low, low, uh, low pressure or if we saw like a high temperature, then uh, something, uh, something which is impossible to happen is, is something like we saw a high pressure uh, and we saw a low temperature. This is what's, 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 what, what we can exclude, something which is shared, which can be excluded by both of them. So basically, this is what we have. We have the, uh, the, 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 the atmospheric pressure, we have the temperature, and then basically this is what we can exclude in general, um, uh, either from the, uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the temperature or from the atmospheric pressure. But what we are seeing is that at least one of them has occurred. So if at least one of them has occurred, so what I'm allowed to exclude is what they can exclude both together. So this is what is undesirable for me, which I don't want to see that. So this is what I have to exclude, and if I excluded this, then I would be I would be satisfying the statement that that S one has occurred or S two has occurred, and so I remove that. I rescale my probability space by what I have removed, and then same thing I compare. And if 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 if, if after comparing T is less likely, if still if still when I saw either low or a low 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 uh, low atmospheric pressure or a high temperature. Uh, for that matter, still, uh, I'm less likely to have a sunny weather than also also having this statement did not give me uh, any informative role. It actually played a negative role to me um, uh, to predict uh, T. And so basically, and so basically, um, uh, so basically, what we have established right now is is a point wide shared information. Which is differentiable almost everywhere. So this is this is this is how we actually define the shared information here. And so if if we if we just think about it again, um, we saw we said that if we know that the statement that either S1 has occurred or S2 has occurred is true, then we can start talking about shared information, or then shared information is accessible in that case. And so basically what we can do is we can define an indicator variable, an auxiliary variable, indicator variable that indicates that this statement is true. And that basically what we were doing in this shared uh, scheme, uh, RRC scheme, is just we were saying that since this statement is the statement which should occur in order uh, for point was a, a shared information to emerge, then basically measuring the information that this statement has about T is just what is shared information. And this is what we get from our uh, measure. So let's just try to now uh, work out the end example again with our measure to see how we can work out uh, the whole thing here. So, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna just explain the, the space that we have here. So. The first row is just the realization that S1 took a realization zero. The second row is that S1 took the realization one. Um, the first column is S2 taking realization zero. The second column is, is X, uh, uh, S2 taking uh, realization one. 
And basically, uh, let's try to compute the PID for, for this particular realization. So first, we will start with the point was shared information, and we are doing it for the realization when S2 takes the value, uh, S1 takes the value 0, S2 takes the value 1, and T takes the value 0. And so first, the idea is that we have to locate um, uh, the, the shared exclusion, right, in order to, uh, to, to see how T um, is with, uh, with, the, with the statement. We need to locate the shared exclusion, we need to remove it, and then we need to rescale the space and compare. So first, this is so this is what we can exclude from S1, the second row, and the first column is is what what, what didn't happen for S2. So S2 did not take the value zero in this case, and so this is what we can um, um, uh, share to exclude. So we can uh, share uh, ex um, um, uh, exclude uh, together, and basically now if we look at the at the probability. So we have um, so we have a chance two to one for zero to happen compared to uh, uh, to t taking the value one. So basically, we have a probability if we after rescaling, then we can say that we have a probability two third that t will happen when we when s one and s two when either s one or s two has happened. And basically, if we compare that to to the probability of t in general, so probability of t in general was three fourths. So basically, T became less likely. So basically, if we receive this, uh, this information that S1 has happened or S2 has happened, so if we receive information that at least that either S1 took the value 0 or S, uh, S2 took the value 1, we still cannot make a good prediction that T would be, uh, would be 0. Um, so let's talk about unique information. So we, we, let's, uh, let's move to unique information from S1. So we said that the mutual information that S1 has about T is just a unique information plus the shared information. So basically, unique information is the difference between the mutual information that S1 has about T and the shared information. And actually, if we, if we uh, just take a moment and think about what is unique information. So unique information that S1 has about T is, the is accessible if we observe S1 and only when we have S1. So, so it's not only that if we observe um, S1, but only if we observe S1. So it's really just bound to S1. So when we say if we observe S1, then this is, this is what we have. This is, this is the mutual information. And now we have to think about the other, uh, other term, only if we observe S1. So only if we observe S1, we need to think about everything which is um, and less likely, um, uh, which is uh, basically, which we, uh, we have to think about everything which is extra than just S1 happening. And this is either S1 happening or S2 has uh, happening. So this is like the weaker statement than, than just S1 has happened. So we need also to remove that part. So basically what we are going to say that, that, share, that, that unique information in, emerges when we see S1 and only when we see S1. So we have to compare what we, what we, what we induce when we see S1 and what we induce when we only have seen S1. So, so this is what we are going to do. So basically, when we see S1, then we have to exclude the, the, the second row. And then basically, the probability that, that, that T has uh, happened now is, is basically 1. So T taking the value 0 is, is basically 1 here. And, 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 and we saw when we excluded both of them, uh, well, what, what has uh, the probability that, uh, that T uh, happened is, is two thirds. So basically, now the probability that T has happened when we, uh, when we see S1 only is, is way higher than the probability that T happens when we see either S1 or S2. And basically, this means that S1 has really some unique information on its own about T. And this is we get like a positive unique information. So S1, if we see uh, that S1 is zero, we can definitely say that T would be zero, right? So basically that was very, very informative for us. And, and, and the, the, I'm gonna work again the unique information for S2. So in that case, first we said that we have to exclude everything, uh, which is, sorry, this should be induced by S2. So this is this part. Um, so we have to exclude the first column. And here, if we exclude the first column, we have like uh, the probability that t uh, takes the value zero is is equally likely with the probability that t takes the value one. So it's like if after rescaling, it will be half the probability that t takes the value zero. And so, 
So basically, comparing that with uh, with the induced uh, with the, with the, with the shared information, which was two thirds, then we have like a drop in the probability. Then we have a negative unique information. And finally, for the synergistic information, it's just uh, it's just we computed is the re remaining information out of the mutual information we computed, and this is what we get. So if we see this realization, if we look, if we, if we have a guarantee that, uh, that at least S1 or S2 has happened, we are most likely not to be able to give a good prediction about T. If we are able to see S1 that uh, has happened, that S1 has taken the value zero, we can definitely say that T uh, is zero. If we see that S2 has, has happened, we have like really, um, we don't know. So we are highly likely to mispredict um, and still we have some synergy. Of course, if you see both of them, we can, we can definitely decide what's the, what's the target in this case. So basically, the, what we are going to do in order to compute our measure, so we compute it for each realization, and then we average over the probability, the joint probability mass here, and then this is what we get. We get a little bit of, of shared information, we get some unique information for each of the sources, and obviously we get, we get, we get synergy. So this is the result which we get from the N example. And the last thing that I want to talk about today is just the operational interpretation of, of our uh, measure. So, so basically, let's say that our agent is receiving the statement that S1 has happened or S2 has happened. And in this scenario, the, uh, the, the agent obviously has a guarantee that at least S1 has happened or S2 has happened. It doesn't have a guarantee that both of them have happened. Uh, have happened. Also, the, uh, the, the agent has no knowledge that W provides any shared information. And the agent is, is required, we choose for it to, to predict that T will happen or not. And basically in this scenario, if the value of shared information is negative, then, then the agent is more likely to mispredict the outcome of the target. So, so this, this, this statement that we gave him that, that either S1 has happened or S2 has happened, as we see the, in, the, in, the, in the adding example, then the, the agent would be reluctant to say whether, whether, whether uh, you will have a zero or one. And the target would be zero or one. And if it's if it's if it's um, if it's positive, then basically the statement was very valuable, and then the agent is more likely to predict. And then finally, the magnitude of it, so how, how large or how small it is, it is in bits, is just tells us how relatively certain or uncertain the agent should be about their outcome. It's just about the relative certainty. So we don't know. Uh, we just have a certainty how how likely it's gonna be. Uh, to rain compared to, to how likely it rains, right? So if you are in the desert, we know that, <laughs> that the chances of, of, being, uh, of it raining is like almost, almost uh, very low. So, so it's really just a relative certainty whether, whether, whether this would happen or not. So this is the magnitude what would tell us. So just to wrap up everything, so as a conclusion, so ISX, which we have seen here, is a multivariate PID that is based only on information theoretic principles. I just discussed it for the case of two sources, but it's, 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 it's easily generated, uh, generalized for, for any number of sources. ISX, uh, this shared information is just a pointwise mutual information, so we didn't get any new principle from somewhere else. Um, ISX uh, satisfies desirable properties for neuroscience applications, such as such as locality and then and, differentiability. And also, ISX has a good chance to be extended to continuous random variables. And now we don't have any PID uh, measure which can work on continuous random variables and ISX being differentiable and pointwise make it a good candidate for continuous random variables. It satisfies also the target chain rule, which is a nature generalization of, of the chain rule and, uh, and mutual information, basically adding a new target um, would not would not um, have a, like weird results for shared information to be very consistent with the, with the previous target that we had, and and finally it's just that we have a learning uh, rules can be derived for ISX and in principle for any PID term, and also the measure is implemented in information dynamical to, uh, toolkit, so you can go and play with it, see what results you can get, and and that's it. And just I want to acknowledge the Volkswagen Foundation for funding our project and also the Ministry of Science uh, for Science and Education of Flower Saxony. And, and, and thank you for listening. And yeah, we can go maybe for questions now. Okay, thank you, Abed. I'll give the, uh, <laughs> the audible applause here. Uh, okay, so um, 
we have a couple of questions here now uh, as, a, as a small preface I can see they're from Connor and Marco for those of you that don't know uh, the field of partial information decomposition it is a, a hotly contested field so I guess it's no surprise that the two questions we have are from uh, two of the uh, stakeholders shall we say um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to put Marco on first because obviously uh, <laughs> If I put Connor on first, that looks like I'm doing it on purpose since he's my postdoc. So I'm going to uh, put Marco's question up here first. I'll, I'll click invite on screen. Marco, you can accept it if you like or, or you don't have to. I'll read the question while you're coming on. Uh, can the average POD quantities that result from this measure still be negative, average misinformation? If so, how would you interpret negative PID atoms in a neuroscientific scenario? Yeah, so basically, yes, uh, the PID, um, um, yeah. Can, yeah, so, so still the PID atoms can be negative, and basically you, the interpretation comes from, from interpreting the, the informative and misinformative. So basically you can say that on average you're going to misinform about the target. That, that's what you can say, that basically uh, if, if you have a negative uh, shared information, meaning that really it's not good for me to look at it either of the sources that's that's not gonna give me a good prediction about the target and the difference to to mutual information is really just a mutual information that that, that you have this this nice jensen inequality which plays a really good role that because you are averaging the same thing which you are putting inside whereas here we are not averaging of the same thing and that's, that's that's the difference we are averaging over the realization and we cannot avoid having a negative shared information or a negative information on average. So, but I think the interpretation, if you put it in that sense of, of, of looking at it from the way of, uh, of just like misinforming in that sense, then, then I think it should be, it should be okay. Marco? Okay, super clear. Super clear, yeah, sorry. I have a poor connection, but I, uh, I got it and it was clear. Thank you, Abed, great talk. <laughs> Okay, Thanks. thank you. I'm going to take Marco off now and I'll invite uh, Connor up. I'll, I'll start reading the question while, while waiting to see if he comes up. So Connor says, in certain applications, it is indeed desirable to have a differentiable function for shared information. Is there any reason why the function should be differentiable though? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I think I understand the question in the thing like, uh, okay, it's desirable that it should be differentiable, but then, okay, yeah, it, it should be differentiable. I mean, it's, it's a little bit more um, uh, more uh, assertive here that we said that it should be differentiable. It's, it's, it's a desirable property, right? So if it's not differentiable and if we try to apply the measure, then basically we are going to run into problems. So at least... This is from my experience, so I tried to, uh, to, to, to use some other measures and it was a little bit a hassle for, for us like when it wasn't differentiable. So basically it was a little bit uh, difficult to work with it. So, so we have some, some vanishing gradients and then, and then you cannot do gradient descent, you have maybe to do a subgradient descent in that case. And I'm not sure how subgradient descent is, is biologically plausible or it's, and then, uh, and you don't have all of these guarantees. So it becomes very, uh, very difficult or sometimes nasty. Uh, so basically having a differentiable measure, it's, it's something good. At least it's, it's like you have an assertive that it's differentiable. And our measure is, it's not exactly, it's differentiable almost everywhere. So like on the boundary, it's not differentiable. It's differentiable almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think my uh, invitation to Connor went through properly, so I don't know if he's got any clarifications. If you do, Connor, just whack it in the comments and we'll we'll bring it through. Or, but there is a clarification question from Martin Beale. I'm not sure if you can see this one. I'll bring that up. Uh, so Martin asks, okay, specifically, what is differentiable uh, with respect to the measure? What is what is differentiable? How do you show that it's differentiable? Yeah, so, so it's differentiable uh, um, compared to the probability uh, mass, so the joint probability distribution. So if you think about the joint probability distribution as your variable, then basically the measure would be differentiable. So it's differentiable where the variable is it's a mutual information, it's, it's a shared information, so we consider the variable for us to be the joint probability distribution. So it's differentiable based on the joint probability distribution. Um, and with respect, sorry, to the joint probability distribution. And then in the example which I gave about the weights, 
So basically, the, the, the firing probability there for the neuron and the updates of the weights, all of it is gonna be is gonna be written out in in, 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 the, in terms of the probability distribution. So basically, if it's differentiable with this the probability distribution, then it's differentiable. Then I'm able to to basically um, update the weight. So basically, if you if you just think it about it in biology or in, in, that, in that example that I gave, our 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 measure is differentiable in terms of the firing rate. Which also in terms of the of the weights, it will be also in terms of the weight if you relate the weights to the firing rate in that case. Okay, well we uh, we should leave things there. Uh, we're certainly going to be revisiting PID uh, from some other perspectives in the in the next couple of days. Uh, thank you, Abed, for the interesting talk. As you know, I'm I'm always uh, loving seeing point wise and uh, and probability mass exclusions. So uh, that was a really nice uh, first talk on PID, and we're looking forward to some more in the next. Uh, 